Hello, this is Peter Twist welcoming you to another radio show for this week. And this week we talk about blogging, as well as meeting Ted Nicholas again. I think they can find a formula to, to write with mm. and kind of uh, understand what has to be done, but really not necessarily feel. And the obvious expert, Elsa Meldridge. Automatically, you are perceived as the obvious expert because you wrote a book on goldfish. Yeah, yeah. And that's true internationally. That's true in America. Mm -hmm. It's true in England. If writing is an art, then blogging is one way of using words to come up with an art. This is because people who are into blogs are the ones who are artistic in their own sense. Carefully choosing words that would best describe their feelings, sentiments, wishes, desires, and everything else. Basically, blogs were first introduced as weblogs that refer to a server's log file. They were created when weblogging hit the virtual market. Since its inception in the mid 1990s, weblogging gradually saturated the virtual community, making the internet a viable source of greater information. However, with weblogging, you still need a website and domain names. But with blogging, you don't need anything, just an account with blog providers. In most cases, these kind of blogs are free of charge. With the onset of blogging in the industry, personal journaling has been a common ground for people who wish to be known all over the world. However, not literally famous, as this is not the case on being popular or a well-known personality. Generally, blogs are created for personal use. Like a journal, people can write about their daily adventures, sentiments, and whatever ideas they want to express online. Nevertheless, with the advent of the online businesses, blogs have gradually taken the limelight in providing businesses a chance to boost their productivity online. This is where the business blogs have taken the limelight. Business blogs are basically created to advertise the services or products of a certain website or online business in order to increase online sales. Moreover, business blogs are also a way of promoting a company so that other readers will know that a certain company exists online. With blogs, entrepreneurs are able to establish a name in the virtual market through articles that can be very useful in the reader's life. From there, you can make money out of blogs by simply syndicating it to your business website. This can be done through the RSS technology. So, if you're thinking of creating a blog, whether for business or for pleasure, you need to know some tips that could help you get through this and make your blog one of the most interesting blogs online. Number one, consider your audience. Even if your blog is generally personal, still, it would be better to consider the minds of your readers. You have to think of something that would interest them. After all, most of the reasons why people love to write blogs is that they're not confined to their own personal motives. Most of them would love to be heard or read and would love to be known in some way or another, even for just a minute. Hence, it's very important to come with a write-up that everybody can understand. Not necessarily that these people can relate to, but that they can just understand it. Pictures speak a thousand words. To make your blogging worth the browsing efforts of your readers, it's extremely nice if you can put some pictures in it. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to place a picture of yourself. Any photographs will do as long as they do not pose danger or insult to anyone who will be reading your blog. Make constructive and beneficial blogs. Even if you're free to write anything you want to say in the world, still, it's better to create something that would be beneficial to your readers. After all, it's information technology that you have here, so better be inclined to provide information rather than sheer quirky entertainment. Avoid making multifaceted and complicated blogs. In order to have an interesting blog, try not to make use of highly technical or highly fluted words. After all, it's not a science course or a debate that you're making, so better stick to some simple facts and short blogs. Bear in mind that most people who use the internet usually do more scanning than scrutinizing each word for word. Therefore, it's better to come up with blogs that will not bore your readers just because you have those lengthy articles. And finally, try and make your blog interactive as much as possible, and if your capacity will allow it, make it interactive, and you can do this by placing some video or audio clips on your blog. You can even have an area for comments or feedback. In this way, you can get some impressions or reactions of other people. Who knows, you might even gain some friends by making them just feel at home on your blog.
Indeed, blogs are not created just for the mere fun of it. it. They have their own purpose in the world of the Internet, and therefore, for people who wish to harness their craft as far as writing is concerned, blogs are the best way to do it. And we'll be talking a bit more about blogs in a few more moments' time. Um, let's join Ted Nicholas again. He, he was with us on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about copywriting. And, of course, one of your skills is being able to then project that onto the person who's reading it because another mistake that is often made is, is talking about the, the object rather than what it can do for you. Is that? Oh. Yeah, that's a very good point, Peter. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, it's a funny thing about I think when people read, they have what I call a BS detector. I mean, <laughs> they're reading the copy or listening, and if somebody isn't really authentic, if you try to fake it, in other words, mm. If you don't really feel that feeling of of the Moroccan leather, of feeling younger and sexier, when you start writing about it or try to write about it, it just comes across as puffery. It comes across as artificial. Yeah. There's just something about authentic, authenticity. And so when we're reading copy, there are very few people in the world, uh, I think you would agree, yeah. when you read their copy, it feels authentic, you know? Yes, yes. And that feeling of authenticity only comes from if you're feeling it as the copywriter when you're when you're projecting it. So this is what this is what a lot of people don't quite get. They think they can find the formula to to write with hmm. and kind of uh, understand what has to be done, but really not necessarily feel uh, because it really does come through your pen or pencil. And by the way, hmm. I believe you write much better copy when you use a pen or pencil and write it out by hand because yeah. the emotions are going right through your body and through your hand. And you can always type it later in the computer or have yeah. somebody type it in the computer. Yeah. But I think if you handwrite it and you feel it, it, there's just something very special. This is what I still do. I'm a very good typist. Which I learned it in the Marine mm -hmm. Corps a long time ago to type 65 words a minute. But I don't use my typewriting skills. I've written all my 15 best-selling books hundreds, probably thousands of ads, mm. all by hand yeah, with, yeah. A, with a pen or pencil and a, and a yellow pad. Yeah, yeah, just take it back to the simplicity of, uh, of that emotion coming out onto the paper. Yes. Yeah. And do you find that uh, when, when, I mean, obviously now you're, you're, you're kicking back a lot more, uh, you know, not working as hard, I suppose, but um, do you find that you either have to lock yourself away in a room or do you sit outside in the sunshine? What do you find is best for you? You know, uh, people ask me that. I, I basically write in different places. I write in my, I have, a, of course, an office in my apartment, yeah. so I sit in the office, or I'll sit in the den, or I'll sit out in the veranda if it's a beautiful sunny day, yeah. or I'll sit in the kitchen. I have got. I love to sit in the kitchen because I have this marble uh, table yeah. that weighs 2,500 pounds in my <laughs> kitchen, God. and there's just something special about sitting in the, in the kitchen <laughs> and writing. Yeah. So it, it in different places, I write on planes and trains and buses and and, and beaches and uh, yeah, almost anywhere. Any, so yeah. it doesn't have to be in a specific place. It's more what I'm feeling at the moment. A lot of times I'll be driving a car. Yeah. And uh, I happen to lie. I love. Uh, I have a convertible um, cabriolet Mercedes, yeah. and I'm driving around here in Switzerland on this beautiful weather. It's beautiful. Been beautiful the last three weeks. Yeah. And as I'm driving around, a lot of times a, a headline or an idea will come to me, and I'll just pull over to the side of the <laughs> of the road, and I'll just start writing just a few sentences that because I don't want to, I find that when I come up with good ideas, be it in the middle yeah. of the night or when I'm driving the car, I don't want to lose that idea. It, one of the most frustrating things for me is, which has happened to me mm. fairly often, is. I come up with a great idea, and then I just can't remember in the middle yeah. of the night, let's yeah. say, and I can't remember the bloody idea when <laughs> after, after I go back. It's really frustrating because ideas, when they're really good, when they're really, you, you feel that they're really so strong, yeah, it's definitely. very important to capture the idea. That's the great Ted Nicholas there, and we'll hope to have more from Ted in future programs. Now, what's an obvious expert? Elsa Meldridge has the answer. An expert is somebody that knows more than somebody else does, mm. meaning that 
whatever you know, and we all know, all kinds of specialties. Mm. Some of us are more expert than others, whatever whatever the issue is, whatever the niche is. Mm. So, if I happen to know more about, let's say, playing the piano or teaching people to play the piano, mm. then perhaps I am going to be an expert in that versus somebody that doesn't, or compared to somebody that doesn't know hardly anything about teaching others to play the piano. But with a lot of things like that, a lot of people, because they they have these talents, they don't class them as talents. So how can somebody kind of work out whether or not they are an expert? Most of us know things we enjoy doing, things mm. we, we've spent some time learning how to do. Anything, we, anything that we have learned to do we are at some kind of expert level. How, how high is that expert level? Well, it can be medium, sort of high, very high. So there is no really great definition as to mm. the word expert, except it's something you know how to do well or how to discuss intelligently or how to teach others how to do or how to coach or mentor. Well, then you could consider yourself an expert in any of the areas mm. that that applies. If I'm the guy who everybody calls around to fix their plumbing at the weekend or, or to fix their computer, that could put me in that category. You are absolutely the expert, mm. but pretty much we're the expert in, in our own minds. In other words, we don't, uh, it's not so much are you the expert it's that somebody else knows about right now it's sort of like what do you feel expert in what do you mm. feel I mean do you uh, enjoy exercise do you enjoy are you an expert at running whatever it is mm. you're an expert at certain points mm. that then takes us to the next level of course of okay when do people perceive that you are an expert right yeah that you can help them the consultant that you call on to assist you you believe is an expert for one reason or another, or mm. the coach. Mm. You call on an expert, let's say, to help you run your computer or fix your computer or teach you how to make a certain program work. Well, that that consultant or coach, mm. you now see as an expert or you wouldn't have called him or her to begin with. Mm. We're in the Internet Marketing Lounge talking about helping people with their, their Internet business. One of the problems that I see that many people say is that they're worried about giving their own identity out on the internet in terms of putting a photograph on the website just by doing something simple like that must put them above lots of other people who have anonymous websites, for example. If you wanted to be identified as what we call the obvious expert, that is where other people say from just observing what's happening with that individual, mm. imaginary individual at the moment, then the uh, obvious expert is one that rises to the co top of the consciousness in whatever specialty it is. Right, okay. A lot of people are obsessed with, say for example they have a website, what they say to me is very often is, oh, I've got to get to the top of the search engines <laughs> or uh, when somebody searches in Google for whatever, then I show up. But to get that kind of result is really difficult. Now, in your book, The Obvious Expert, you talk about other ways to promote yourself, to drive people to your website. The website happens to be one of the areas you That's become right. known as the obvious expert. Yeah. There are a dozen different strategies mm -hmm. they, that one applies to become known as the obvious expert. And, and when we say the obvious expert, that means whatever the skill is, whatever the specialty is, whatever the niche is, you want to be known as the the one, the, the, the main person to go to for information mm -hmm. about that particular topic. Yeah. Whatever it is. Pick a topic. Goldfish. Goldfish. <laughs> and you want to be known as the goldfish expert, mm -hmm. the, the person that knows everything there is probably needed to be known about goldfish if I had that need, that concern. Mm -hmm. And so, in order for that to occur, 
there are certain things you would do in order to let the world know. So that I think goldfish, I think of you. I think of your name. I think of your your, your image, your picture, mm-hmm. everything. Okay. So let's just run quickly through what the dozen things you might do. Mm-hmm. Might be. Okay. For instance, you would write a book, uh, and you would write a book about goldfish and about raising goldfish and raising goldfish for fun and profit. And now all of a sudden, because you're the author of that book, you are an obvious expert. Right. Somebody picks up this book, they see goldfish, they see your name. Automatically, you are perceived as the obvious expert because you wrote a book on goldfish. Yeah. yeah. And that's true internationally. That's true in America. Mm-hmm. It's true in England. It's okay. true everywhere. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, you haven't got time to write a book this week. Yeah, However, you, you make it sound so easy, write a book. <laughs> well, well, okay, let's move <laughs> gradually toward it then. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, uh, maybe you could find time next month to write a report on exactly the right kind of goldfish to buy to populate your aquarium with that will survive long time. Right. That happens to be perhaps a concern that people have. So the exact specific type species, if there are such things in goldfish, or perhaps another report on exactly the best kind of food to bring longevity to goldfish, or what you do with aquariums, to with chemicals, or but maybe four or five different kinds of reports dealing with goldfish. Now, you write a report like that right. with your name on it, all of a sudden, you are indeed going to be perceived again as the obvious expert for goldfish. Mm. Now, do, let's say, a dozen a dozen reports like that. A dozen reports like that, do one a month. At yeah. the end of a year, take a dozen reports, what do we have? You got your book. We have a book. That's right. One year later, now you've got the goldfish book, mm. and you're the obvious expert on goldfish. Now we'll start on a new topic next year. Because the, I think the big fright is when you say book, isn't it? That's what people think. Oh, exactly. book. Can't do that. Yeah. And, and, and now you may say, oh my gosh, I can't do a whole report every month. Mm. Fine. Let's do an article a week then. Yeah. Uh, let's break let's break a report into four segments. So one report into four segments, one article a week. Mm. One article a week. Let's go an article. We'll submit the articles to magazines and journals. Again, you have an article that's mm. published with your name. What are you then? You're the, the obvious, obvious expert. expert. Right. And there we go from there. We take, okay, now, okay, now we've got a weekly article we've committed to, and we do that for four weeks. Now we have a report. Yeah. Do each of that project all the way through. At the end of the year, we got a book. Mm. Okay, so you've written your book and you've written your reports. What kind of, what ways can we use, uh, whether it's the media or whatever, to promote ourselves? Because obviously we now we've got to tell people about the book. <laughs> well, the book uh, could be promoted in a very a variety of ways. For instance, let's do a newsletter now, mm. uh, an e-zine or a newsletter, yeah. and we'll get that out. And guess what our newsletter is going to be about? Maybe it'll be a monthly newsletter or e-zine all about goldfish. Goldfish, yeah. Now, if you're the publisher or the editor or, uh, of a newsletter or an e-zine on goldfish, once again, you're the obvious expert there. Now, we will mention, of course, in the newsletter and the e-zine, about the new book that has just come out, or that's about to come out. Mm. Or we'll use an ask, what's called an ask database campaign of some kind to ask our growing audience what kind of questions do they want answered. Mm. And as we answer the questions and look for answers to the questions, once again, we become the obvious expert. Is one of the simplest ways to, uh, say, send out a press release to these people? Because, oh, I mean, I, they're always hungry for information, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would, for sure, every time... We did a report, or we did an article that got published in a special journal. Well, why not send a press release about that to the radio stations, to the TV stations, and to the newspapers? So that once again, when it happens in the newspapers, you are perceived as, with your name being marketed, you're the obvious expert about goldfish again. This is WMR.com. You've interviewed many experts yourself for your, for your book, The Obvious Expert. Anyone that wants to be known as the expert is really required to do certain strategies, let's say, like we've already talked. Mm-hmm. Delivering lectures is another one. Right, yeah. Get, you deliver a lecture and a talk about 
goldfish and you're up in front of people, you are the obvious expert there. You have to be sort of comfortable with the fact that the information you're giving forth is helping a lot of people and therefore you can't be too shy about the fact that you're being perceived as the expert. In fact, you really want to let people think you're the expert because when they know that about you, that will magnetically, effectively bring business to you. Mm. So you can't be shy about it. But not in an arrogant way. No, no, In, in, no, in a meaningful, no. helpful way. And then you do each of these, these other kinds of things where we're doing the books, the reports, the articles, the newspapers, the uh, delivering lectures. Oh, by the way, that was B-R-A-N-D. That's brand. To go on to the local level then, say about contacting associations or local businesses, how do you go about doing that? I just have put together, in my case, a lecture. Uh, if I was going to be doing a lecture and I was now going to become this week the obvious expert regarding goldfish so I could join your team and mm. do the goldfish concept with you, <laughs> then I would want to think, well, let's see, who wants to know about goldfish? Mm. Uh, who, where, where's my best target audience? Where do they congregate? Yeah. Uh, I would be doing uh, offering to do talks at pet stores and aquariums and people that sell fish. Uh, I would be offering to do talks at libraries where there are books. I would be offering to do where there are books that people take out on, right. on fish. Right. I would be offering to do talks, mini seminars, brief talks, 30, 45 minute talks on goldfish at bookstores in our country, Borders and yeah. Barnes yeah. and Nobles, right. uh, places like that. That's Elsom Eldridge there talking about how to become the obvious expert and I believe his book is still available on Amazon. Right, we started off the show talking about blogging, and um, let's conclude now by looking at five reasons why blogging is the new internet marketing tool. Now, as we mentioned, blogging is a concept that started in the late 90s. It used to be a way to comment on an existing web page, an opportunity for visitors and readers to react or voice out one's opinion on the page. What started as a single-sentence commentary has evolved into pages of personal takes on just about anything and everything under the sun. As it continues to move forward, online advertising has tapped into the blog's potential. So here are five reasons why you should look at blogging as an internet marketing tool. Blogging is simple. The simplest way to get your piece on the net is through blogging. No skills are necessary, an average adult can read and type, or at least click a mouse. It's like having a virtual piece of paper and you just write your ideas, experiences, new products, and hope that the truth behind your article comes out and it entices your reader to try your product. If you have a PC and an internet connection, who doesn't these days, then you can blog and advertise. Blogging is authentic. In this day and age where advertising saturates our lives, we question the credibility of promoters' claims. However, in blogs, real people share their real-life experiences, unscathed by paid advertising. Reading blogs about first-hand product use is like talking to people about their first-hand experience. You definitely want to buy a tried and tested product. Blogging is free. Because blogging is yet to be proven as a mainstream online advertising media, most sites see it as an, something to uh, augment current marketing tools and thus offer it for free. Any opportunity for free web time is definitely a, a bonus, especially to businesses that are starting up. Needless to say, paid blog pages can generate more income for your seriously growing business. Blogging builds credibility. As you get more and more into writing your experiences on a particular product or industry, your readers come to realise that they can depend on your posts for their information needs. As such, you become an expert on it. As a consequence, more readers visit your site and more bloggers link to your blogs. As companies and professional organisations notice the growth of your readership base, they may soon get in touch with you for advertising on your blog page or make you an affiliate which pays you for every referral generated from your blog site. Blogging builds your market. Unless you're a Hollywood star, chances are only your mum reads your posts. Mum has a lot of friends, so she can let her friends know how interesting your blog site is. But you do not need to depend on your mum to increase your readership base. Look into the following ways to build your market through blogging. By using email. Today, blogging is overcoming the email's popularity in quickly and effectively reaching and expanding a market. 
In this age of speed and quick access, logging in and downloading email is simply taking longer than clicking into a blog site. Let them explore your site by using a short email message as a teaser to your blog site. If your email is on an entirely different subject, use your email signature to give a link back to your blog site. By using subscriptions. An easy way to get your readers' email is to give them an opportunity to subscribe to your blog site. Keep some exclusive information for your subscribers to entice readers to subscribe and give their email address. Just be responsible in using their email address, of course, as the last thing you want is a comment on your blog saying that you're a spammer. Understand your readers. Conduct a simple survey for your readers to understand their profile and advertising preferences. Ask consumers to give you feedback on a post, an ad link or a trial that you shared. In this way, it's like interviewing your readers without the commitment and intrusion of a face-to-face -face interview. Join a blog network. A network of blogs may be a collection of blog sites that share the same industry, interest readership base, uh, payment mode, and so on. Consumers find credibility and convenience in clicking one link to several real bloggers about a single subject. Clearly, more bloggers are better than one. And by using RSS. RSS is the fastest growing technology on the internet today. As such, having RSS feeds to your blog is definitely another means of generating awareness for your readership base. Having a variety of feeds can add interest to your blog site. So there we are, an insight into blogging. Hope you found that useful. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to today's show. My thanks again to Ted Nicholas and Elson Eldridge for joining me. For the moment, from me, Peter Twist, I'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.